Good morning. Welcome to First United Methodist Church, Elizabethton, Tennessee. I'm Bill Heaton, lay leader. Lots of things going on. Several things to announce. Um, first of all, welcome to our visitors. Uh, if you're visiting here today, we have a tear-off sheet in the bulletin. You can fill that out and drop it in the offering plate. And uh, Pastor Robert will make a personal contact with you. If you're watching online, just call the church. Robin will set something up, and he'll visit with you that way. Um, Sunday school classes are going strong. So if you're not involved in the Sunday school class, it's a great way to get more involved in the church. Um, this Wednesday <clears throat> is the um, beginning of Lenten, and we have a, a Bible study starting at 6. It's a Lenten study, Pastor Robert says. It starts at 6 o'clock on Wednesday evening. Um, and if you've not, there's, there's a, a meal before the, the service. If you've not let anybody know that you're going to be coming to that, you need to fill out the RSVP form. It's in the bulletin. Um, dinner's at 5 o'clock, 5 to 5.45 in a fellowship hall. And by the way, the, the Lenten Bible study is in, in this room. Um, anyway, tear off the, the form in the bulletin and drop it in the offering plate so Sonny will know how many is going to be here. Um, I think that's it for the Lenten thing. We're glad to have everyone here today. It's great to see all of you. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
morning. Let us pray. God of mercy, and God of steadfast love, lead us in truth this day, in this time of our worship. Let us know that your goodness has been revealed in Jesus Christ and that he comes to proclaim your kingdom and that he calls all of us to follow the way that he leads us. For all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. Would you please stand as you're able and sing our opening hymn, My Jesus, I Love Thee. Remain standing for our affirmation of faith. Please stand. Affirmation of faith for today and for the Lenten season is going to be the Nicene Creed. A little bit different from the Apostles' Creed, a little bit longer. It is in the hymnal at number 880, but it will also be on the screen. Let us join together in this historic statement of the Christian faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through Him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory 
to judge the living and the dead, and His kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. At this time, if our ushers will come to serve us, we will collect our morning offering. As they are coming, let me thank you for your generosity and the way that you give for the work of the church in all the many different ways that we seek to spread the gospel of Jesus. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this opportunity to respond to your grace made known to us in Jesus Christ. Accept the gifts that we give and use them for the work of his kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
seated. And at this time, if the children will come up, we'll have a few moments together. Let me ask you a question. How do you, how do you, do you know what you use to tell time, what time it is? What? Uh, what I mean, what, oh. you use a clock. Like, you see, there's a clock back there. And a watch, too. And a watch, too. See, I've got a watch on. And I wanted to show you something, something really old. You know, someone, some bright, smart person figured out that you could put a watch on a wrist. I have a watch on. I have do you? It. But it, I can't make it work. You can't. Well, I understand how that can be. Because I've got an old watch. Because before somebody figured out how to put it on the wrist, you had to carry it around in your pocket. What and that's that? what it looked like. That's a, what is that? That's a pocket watch. Oh, yeah. I knew it was. See? My DJ has one of those. Yeah, this is, this is very old. This is, a little, this is like about 120, 130 years old. And it belonged to one of my wife's great uncles, I believe it was. And we, we keep it, but we don't usually wind it up. It actually, I actually said it this morning. And can you have it? <laughs> well, maybe not. It's not mine to give away. It belongs to my wife. <laughs> Technically, it's not yours. But I had, to, I had to set it this morning and wind it up. And if you don't wind it up every day, eventually it stops running because it's an old-fashioned clock. But a long time ago, a long time ago, men used to carry these in their, their pocket. And this is what they used to tell the time. Now we use... If they're mm -hmm, Now we use a wristwatch. And, you know, a lot of people have a phone that tells them the time and the weather and all kinds of other information. And we like that because it helps us to know what's going on. But once upon a time, you were doing pretty good if you just even knew what time it was. You tell me what time it says it is? 10. 10 what? 10 4. 10 4. 10 4, yeah. Well, the, the, those, are, those are minutes. So, that's, so 10... If you, look, if you look, yeah, if you look really, really, really close, you see a little 20 there in that red. You see it real small there? It's four. Well, it's by, beside four. the four. It's 10, it's 10 Yeah, you have, that, you have to use one, one way to read it for the hours and one for the minutes. Can I try to do it? You can look at it. It looks like it's not on the 10 anymore. No, nah, it's not on the 10 anymore. It's kind of going past. Yeah, but I it's. Have, I have hmm? watch, and when I, every time I get up, then it then it clicks on the other one. Mm -hmm. Watches are are you as you get older, you're going to want to know the time a lot more than you do now. But but now. <laughs> I'm almost five years old. Almost five years old. Well, that's a, another way of keeping track too. Do you know keeping knowing what time it is is always a good thing for us to do. It keeps us from being late. Like for coming to church, or for going to school, or if you're going to visit someone, or if you're late for work, or if you're late for work, or if you're late for dinner, or supper, or lunch, or breakfast. So it's good to know what time it is, and knowing what time it is is important for us in our faith too, because it's always a good time to remember God and Jesus, no matter what time it is. We like Sunday morning at 10 o'clock to help us do that, but there are other times too. I'm glad you're here, and my watch tells me it's time now for children's church and back to nursery. So let me say a prayer, and then y'all can go. Dear God, we give you thanks for helping us to know what time it is and for watching over us in all the things that we do with our time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Our first reading this morning comes from Psalm 25, verses 4 through 10. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love. For they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me. For your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. And the gospel reading this morning comes from the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 9 through 15. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
We appreciate the work that the choir puts into all that they do, and I also want to take a second to acknowledge our musicians, particularly for the offertory. The Lord's Prayer was very nice, very good. That's a very meaningful song for many of us. Thank you for that. The central theme of Jesus' preaching is the kingdom of God. And we're told that right at the very beginning. Jesus says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. In fact, in Mark's gospel, that's the very first thing Jesus says. All four of the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, at one point or another will tell us what Jesus says first. Now, they all have their own way of, of communicating to us about Jesus. And you add up all four of those different ways of thinking about Jesus and you get a, a, a full, complete picture of who Jesus is. So Matthew, in Matthew's gospel, he starts out by having... Jesus not say anything until Jesus meets John and John questions, why should I baptize you? And Jesus says, it is to fulfill all righteousness. In Luke's gospel, the first thing that Jesus says is not as an adult, but as a boy. And he's in the temple and he's gone there away from Mary and Joseph and they're hunting for him and they come to find him and they find him in the temple and say, why are you here? And the first thing Jesus says in the gospel of Luke is, I had to be about my father's business. And Then in John's gospel, the first thing that Jesus says after his baptism, he hasn't said anything, and two would-be disciples start to follow him, and he turns around and looks at them and says, what are you looking for? Mark, ignoring what he might have known about Jesus' birth, skipping quickly over the baptism and the temptation, gets to the theme that he wants to emphasize in his gospel and that he wants us to know, and it is Jesus comes and Jesus says the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. And Jesus constantly talks about the kingdom of God. Now you will not find that phrase, kingdom of God, in the Old Testament. It's not there. There are plenty of kings that are there. There are plenty of kingdoms that are mentioned, never the kingdom of God. God is referred to as a king, but never do you see the phrase, the kingdom of God. That's only a phrase in the New Testament. And I think that Mark wants us to understand it's Jesus who comes up with this phrase, the kingdom of God. We want to know about the kingdom of God, or at least Mark thinks we want to know about that. But kingdom is a little a little quaint and old-fashioned to our 21st century ears. Europe has got kings. It's got kingdoms. Kings and kingdoms are the, are the stuff of tradition. That's, that's why you travel to England to see, to see all of those things related to the king as some sort of a historic Disneyland kind of feeling. We, we do things differently. Here. We don't have a king. We don't have a kingdom. We choose people through other means rather than a line of hereditary birth year after year. Some places in the world don't even do that. Someone just comes into power and becomes a, a, a dictator who has more power than any king of history ever had. But even if we look at the kingdoms that are mentioned in the Bible, in the Old Testament, to talk about a kingdom is problematic because the kings of history are often more known for their 
evil actions than the good that they do. And the history of Israel is no exception. Most of the kings are just not very good at being a king like God wants. Most of them are pretty evil. Jesus was well aware of the history and well aware that as bad a history as it was of some of those kings, that there were people in his day who still wanted one. Not Caesar, they wanted their own king. The disciples following Jesus are starting to realize some things about him. They're starting to realize that that Jesus is not just some ordinary guy. They, They start talking about Jesus as the Messiah, which is one of those titles of the king. These crowds that start to follow Jesus begin to realize certain things too. Jesus doesn't want them to have misconceptions about what it means, but they do. For example, in John's Gospel, he tells us that after Jesus fed the 5,000 with the loaves of bread, the crowd wants to take Jesus by force and make Him king. And He has to just sort of disappear so that they won't do that. Jesus wants us to understand that the kingdom of God is really something different. And only then do we understand what it means to think of Jesus as king. The kingdom of God is not a kingdom of geography. It doesn't have borders. It doesn't have a bureaucracy. The kingdom of God is explained by Jesus in all of his many stories, many parables, is a kingdom of the heart and the mind and the soul. It's a kingdom that's meant to encompass all people and to encompass all time. The kingdom of God is the rule and authority over our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the very embodiment of the kingdom of God. But it is only in understanding the unique way that Jesus is that king do we understand what he means. So we can talk about the throne of Jesus being a cross and the crown of Jesus being a crown of thorns. It's Very different from any ordinary king. The kingdom is the assertion that God rules and the conviction that God will rule. And for Jesus, at the very beginning of the gospel, the time was right to proclaim the kingdom of God for all to know. But it will take some time to put all the pieces together till we understand what Jesus means. We will only fully know the impact of the kingdom of God once we know what Jesus does, that He goes to Jerusalem, that He goes to the site and time of the crucifixion and resurrection. Now, Jesus Jesus faced temptations before the announcement of the kingdom. And we face temptations because of the kingdom that has been announced to us. So in the season of Lent, one of the things that we do is we take seriously this talk about temptations. We can't read about the temptations in detail in Mark because he doesn't give it to us. You've got to go to, to another gospel to find out the details of it. But Mark compresses all this, this issue of temptations into one small section, just that Jesus was tempted. The Spirit forces him to go out into the wilderness and there he was for 40 days tempted by Satan with the wild animals and the angels. 40 days. You and I are now four days into Lent. Started on Wednesday, so there's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. That's your four days. Not today. Today's not a day of in Lent. It's a Sunday of that is in Lent, not of Lent. In other words, Sundays don't count for that 40 day. 
Sunday is always a celebration of the resurrection, even in Lent. Now, what that means is, if, if you have decided that this Lent you're going to do some sort of a spiritual practice, that Sundays is kind of a different day. So if your spiritual practice is fasting, like some people fast from some kind of item of food or some kind of activity that they normally do. I've seen people who talk about fasting from chocolate during Lent or fasting from any drink except water during Lent or fasting from dessert during Lent. All of that is a, a, a kind of a little spiritual devotion. But if you are, Sundays don't count. So if you're fasting from chocolate, go ahead, have a little bit of chocolate today. If you're fasting from dessert, help yourself. Self-denial is always good, but Sunday is a feast day. Sunday is a day to celebrate the goodness and the glory of God. And we don't do that with a fast, but with a feast. But whatever you're doing, if you're doing something that is related to a spiritual practice during Lent, keep in mind, it's really meant to turn us more in the direction of God, in the direction of the kingdom of God. On Ash Wednesday, many of you are here, and I said, repent and believe in the gospel as I mark each person with the ashes. Well, in Mark, we learn that the kingdom of God is what the gospel is about. I could have said, repent and receive the kingdom of God. It's the same idea. Repent here is really a word that just means stop going in what direction you are going and go in a different direction. Sometimes we think of repent as in stop doing a bad thing or being sorry for having done a bad thing. And there might be some truth to that, but repent is really about going in a new direction. And for us to talk about repent means that we turn from wherever we're, we are and whatever we're doing and focus on going in the direction of the kingdom of God. Lent may be a time to start that, or it might be a time to stop and reassess how we're doing if we're really going in the direction that God wants. And if not, then we can make an adjustment. Jesus tells us that it's good to focus on that. He's talked about a, a narrow way, and each of us have got our own path to the kingdom of God. As long as it's focused on the kingdom of God, we're going in the right direction. But the easy temptation is to get off track. We are so easily distracted in our world. I once heard it said that, that nowadays, instead of looking at a clock to see what time it is, we're looking at one to see how much time we've got before we have to do something. Because our lives are so full, and all of these things fill our minds and, and pull us in all kinds of different directions. This time of Lent helps to remind us is that so many of those things are relatively unimportant when compared with the kingdom of God. To recognize the kingdom of God as the content of Jesus' teaching is to recognize that so much of our world is not. So much of our world, the world that we have made, is not as Jesus would have it. But here's the thing. All of that just simply fades into nothingness by comparison with the kingdom of God. We see that even in Scripture. John is an important guy in Scripture. John comes in each of the Gospels before Jesus and he does his baptizing thing. John is like an Old Testament prophet. He calls out the sins of the people. Yet, even John disappears. He fades away. He says it himself in John's gospel, I must decrease, but he, Jesus, must increase. In Mark's gospel, he doesn't say a word. 
He just baptizes Jesus and then he disappears. One time Jesus said, John is the greatest who ever lived. But even John, as great as he was, is less than anyone who is least in the kingdom of God. The kingdom is just a whole other realm. It's a whole other way of thinking, of being. The kingdom is, is that place that we are called to where passions and persuasions and politics and posturing and the power and glory of this present world just simply evaporate by comparison. This is where we're called to be. And so Jesus says to us, and we hear it at the beginning of Lent, the kingdom has drawn near. Now the kingdom's not here in its completeness, but it's a dawn. It's a light that starts. Think about it like this. This morning, I sat downstairs before we were getting ready to leave, and there was no sun out. It was, it was light, but there was no sun. It was coming up somewhere. And there was light coming with all of the, the darkness. And you knew what was going to happen. The sun is going to come up and it's going to be another day. That's how the kingdom of God is working. Jesus' announcement is that first dawn of the kingdom. So much so that even though the kingdom isn't fully here, we can still live in it. In Lent, we're called to recognize that that's where we belong, in the kingdom of God. That's where God wants all of His creation and all of the people that God has made to be. The only requirement is to follow Jesus who brings it in. That's what we should be experiencing in church. Church is meant to be a foretaste of the kingdom of God. And in its best days, the church actually does this. It approaches being this kind of wonderful place where everyone is welcome and everyone needs to be. But the church is still flawed. We still make some dreadful mistakes in our age and in the ages past because we all fall tem to temptation. And it's temptation that draws us away from the kingdom. Now, if Mark doesn't tell us the details of the temptation, he doesn't say what Satan said, he just mentions it. But then he adds a couple of really strange thoughts. Wild beasts and angels. What an interesting combination. No mention of bread coming from rocks or jumping off the temple. No mention of the earthly power that Satan can give, just wild animals and angels. The wilderness is a place of wild animals. Those who, who lurk in shadows and hide in brush and trees. We've got wild animals around where Carla and I live. I don't really fear them too much because they're deer and turkey. But if you're out at night and it's completely dark and you hear something shuffling around in the dark, well, you don't know if it's a deer or if it's a turkey or if it's a wolf or a bear. You don't know what it is. Looking for some opportunity to strike? There are plenty of wild animals, and there are plenty of wild animal-like temptations just looking to devour us. But the kingdom has come near, and those shadows are, are disappearing, and the light of the sun is growing brighter and brighter. And if there are wild beasts, there are also angels, according to Mark. Angels are messengers. That's what the word means. Or perhaps they are messages. They come from God. The words of Scripture, the teaching of Jesus, the fellowship of other believers, the good things of the kingdom, the message of Jesus Christ crucified and risen, the Lord of heaven and earth. Those are the angels that we have. And if there are beasts 
with which we must contend there are also gifts and graces from God that make it possible for us to see our way through the wilderness to the kingdom of God where we are called to be. This Lent, today, hear the good news. The kingdom of God has drawn near. Repent and believe the gospel. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Part of repenting is acknowledging that we are not as we should be. So during Lent, we have added in a prayer of confession. It will be on the screen, and you will also see it in the bulletin. Let us pray together. Merciful God, we confess that we have often fallen to many temptations because we have neglected your ways. We have forgotten the grace of Jesus for ourselves and for others. Forgive us, we pray, and lead us in your steadfast love. Lord, have mercy. And it says we sing Kyrie. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness by the power of the Holy Spirit, and keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please be seated. And let us continue in a spirit of prayer. Lord God, your ways are to us steadfast love and faithfulness. Make us mindful to keep these ways and not fall to temptations to stray. Renew our following of Jesus Christ, for he is our merciful Savior. May we see the dawning of your kingdom and may we live in that dawn. Hear all the prayers that we make to you this day, the needs and concerns that are part of our lives that are part of our community and the world around us. We pray for those in need, for those struggling, for those who need your comfort and your presence, for those who are sick, for those who are struggling with decisions, for those who are finding themselves struggling simply with life. We pray for these. We pray for those who are close by that we see every day. We pray for those who are far away, people who we will never know, but those that we know of. and We know that all are known to you. For you are God of all, and you seek for all people to know your grace, your love, your goodness that has been expressed to us in Jesus Christ. Make us confident 
throughout this Lenten season to call on you and to come into your presence and to offer our words of praise and thanksgiving for all that you do and to remember all that Jesus has taught us, including the words that we can use when we join together in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Please stand for our closing hymn, I Love Thy Kingdom, Lord. by my watch it's time for worship to end and end we will but it is not the time for you to cease being the follower of Jesus Christ in fact it is the time for you to begin and to begin again for our world needs to know what Jesus has done and you are part of his kingdom in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit go in peace Amen.